Hello and welcome to Zero Now. I'm John Winter and in today's session we will be demystifying the new Health and Safety at Work Act and providing an overview of what it means for you and for your business. I'm joined today by Gordon MacDonald, CEO of WorkSafe New Zealand. WorkSafe New Zealand is of course New Zealand's workplace health and safety regulator. Thanks very much for joining us today, Gordon. Pleasure, John. Uh, I just want to start off with the basics. Why do we need a new health and safety law? Well, things are not great in New Zealand when it comes to workplace health and safety. There's about one death from an accident every week in the workplace. There are about 15 premature deaths from work-related ill health. So whether you look at that through the lens of economic cost, it's about three and a half billion dollars worth to the economy, but more importantly, you look at that through the lens of the emotional cost of those people who don't come home and then all those people who are injured, some of them very severely, and that's a big price to pay. It's about twice as bad as Australia at the moment. It's about three times as bad as equivalent stats in the UK. So generally, our proposition is we can, we should, and we must do better. Wow, they're pretty powerful statistics. Does the new health and safety law just make things a lot more complicated and more expensive for businesses? No, we're trying to get people to change the way they think about health and safety. Instead of it being the thing I do on Friday afternoon once I've done all the other important stuff of the, uh, the business, and I do it largely to keep myself out of court and away from fines. Think about it this way. Um, your number one asset as a business is your people. You want to look after your number one asset. Mm -hmm. So think of it in, term, in those terms. Think of it in terms of productivity of the business and the dis disruption and cost that an accident would actually cause. Think about it in terms of reputation with your suppliers and customers. Think of it in those terms and then you think that health and safety is a real positive benefit and it's part of being a good business. So that's the message that we're trying to get across. So complying with the law means everyone can be a winner, really. Absolutely. Um, could you take us through some of the key points of the new law? Yeah, well, some of the key points, just in brief, um, the primary duty is on a thing called a PCBU, a person conducting a business or undertaking. It makes a lot get fixated on the definition. It generally, if you're in business, in work, then the law applies to you. You have to take a duty of care, which is to take precautions such as are reasonably practicable for the health and safety of people who are your workers, but also anybody who may be affected by your work activity. Second key duty is that people who are these things, these PCBUs, businesses where they have responsibilities that overlap, they need to communicate and cooperate together in delivering good risk prevention in the workplace. Third point is that workers must be involved in this process. It's about doing it with them, not to them. They're the front line. They can spot things that are going on. Utilize that resource from management's perspective to tell you whether things are working or not and what risks are appearing or not. So really engage them in the process. And the fourth key point about the new law is this idea of due diligence. Leadership sets the tone. It sets the policy, it sets the resources. It, by its behavior, it shows by example what it wants from its workers. So due diligence is a duty of senior officers in organizations to understand their risks and to make sure that they've got information on how they are controlled and how they're tracking against what they want to achieve. Okay, I've, I've heard about um, board members resigning from board positions yeah. or, or people putting their houses into trust mm. just because they're a bit fearful of any financial mm. penalties. Mm. Uh, has that happened and should it be happening? No, it's not happened. Uh, some people may have resigned from boards, but um, I'm not aware that anybody's put their house into trust. Neither should they. There's not, neither, I don't see a need for either of those things. Um, in a way, the penalties that have existed for reckless disregard of the law by people in senior positions has been there since 1992, mm. so not much has changed there. So, uh, no, they don't need to do that. In a, in a sense, for those who are in senior positions in companies, it's only the application of the, the way they exercise governance over the finances and the books and the sales or whatever it is that they're doing. Just apply those same disciplines to health and safety. Okay, cool. And in terms of um, paperwork then, I presume you need to keep a, a health and safety policy and have some sort of hazard register. Mm. Once you do that, does that mean you're compliant? No, because what you, those things may be uh, part of the health and safety system that you're introducing, but they themselves are not what's important. We will be measuring, and people should be measuring themselves, against not the numbers of volumes of paperwork that they have mm. on the shelf, but what people are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So hazard registers, policies, as a way of setting the framework, as a way of communicating with people, fine, but it's how they are behaving in the workplace on a daily basis that matters. That's the key 
to delivering good health and safety. Great. And we've got a little um, icebreaker video to watch, is that right? Yeah, so we're producing lots of tools uh, and we produce these icebreakers. And we're very conscious that if we start a conversation with uh, a group of workers or managers with, uh, we're going to tell you about section 19, subsection 1 of the Health and Safety at Work Act, uh, we've lost them before we start. So we've introduced these sorts of icebreakers, which are just a way of getting easing people into a conversation about some of the key points of the law. Okay, cool. It's a very short, fun, quirky video. Let's take a look. Oh, morning, boss. We've got a van load of roofing tiles being delivered today. Yeah, and I was thinking if we could get four helicopters to escort the van from the street to the site, you know, for safety's sake, so the blokes see it. What, four? You think there's too many? Not practical. We have about three helicopters, is that enough? Still too many. Two? The new health and safety laws aren't about demanding the impossible. But you need to be as practicable and reasonable as you can to prevent illness and injury. And to get your workers home healthy and safe. That's a really cool video and a fun yeah. way of looking at yeah. stuff. Yes. Yeah, well, we've got uh, lots of stuff like that and more on our website, so people should go there, both um, those sorts of things, but also information on how to deal with the law, what some of the concepts mean, but also how to deal with some of the more everyday risks that people come across. Cool, and I have taken a look at your WorkSafe website, and um, everybody who's registered for this session today will get a link in the follow-up email, a link to that website, so check out uh, all that cool stuff that's available there. So we've received quite a few questions in advance of today's session, and I'm just going to run through some of those questions with you now, Gordon. Um, so the first question, let's say I employ the services of a contractor mm -hmm. to do work on my business premises. Mm -hmm. If that contractor is a little lax with health and safety and they injure themselves, mm -hmm. am I liable? Not necessarily, no. This is about you need a conversation with that contractor about how they manage their health and safety risks. But largely, you're going to be buying the services of a contract because they can do things that you can't. So in those circumstances, of course, we're not asking you to be the expert in their business. So you have to rely on them. You make those inquiries at the start, but it doesn't make you liable for everything that may go wrong by the contractor's actions. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, and speaking of contractors, there is a term called overlapping mm. duties. So mm. what's that all that about? Well, it recognises that the world is more complicated than uh, me as an employer working with my worker within the four walls of one room. So it recognises that actually different uh, businesses work together on the same site. Obviously, the most clear example is on a construction site where we have electricians from one company working with uh, woodworkers from another company, working with brickies from a third company. So where they're working on the same site, they have overlapping duties so that where risks are created by one that might affect the other, they simply need to have a conversation about that and communicate how they are collectively going to manage those sorts of risks. Great. You make it sound so simple. Um, health and safety, is it really a big deal for any of us that are just working in offices? I think the answer to that is, is no, because one of the key concepts uh, behind the Act is proportionality. What does that mean? It means that the things that you need to do in terms of cost, difficulty, time and effort need to be related to the risks that you actually run. Now, in an office environment, most of those risks are at the low end. So the stuff that you need to do mm. needs to be pitched at the le that level of risk. Okay, cool. And you mentioned before about worker engagement. Can mm. you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's that point that um, they are kind of on the receiving end. They're on the receiving end of good health and safety, all those things I mentioned about good staff engagement and, and all those sorts of things, but they cop for it when it goes wrong. So they really need to be involved in the process, uh, get their input to what's going to work for them in terms of risk precautions. Because if we can make the way to do it safely, the way that is the quick and efficient way to do it, then it will be done, but we have to draw them into that process. It needn't be long and complicated. Some of this is about sitting down over a cup of tea and a bacon roll at the start of the day, talking about what are the risks we're gonna face, how we're gonna manage those together, but it's using those sorts of tools to engage them in the process. Great, uh, we've got a question here. Can you explain work-related health? Mm, um, okay, so I think, most people get when they see um, a circular saw in a woodworking shop, uh, if you put your hand near it, it's going to do you some serious harm. Um, but that's one type of risk. Another type of risk is that that arises from dust, 
and fume or noise or whatever it might be. These are risks that are health-related risks. So if I breathe in silica dust, if I breathe in asbestos dust, then that is going to cause me some problem. Probably not today and probably not tomorrow, but over time I might suffer a condition. And once I do, with, for instance, silica or asbestos, by the time that problem has appeared, I can't do anything about it. So work-related health is that issue about being exposed to substances in the workplace that could have an impact on health. It's also about thinking about what am I coming to the workplace with mm. in terms of my health. So um, if I'm doing a safety critical role but I'm colour blind, well that might have an implication if I'm trying to pick out different colours and that's important in the role. If I'm coming to work and I'm aged or I've got a bad back and my job is heavy and manual, then that needs to be taken into account in how work is designed and managed. So that's what work-related health is about. And flip back to that statistic I mentioned earlier, 15 people a week are dying prematurely from work-related ill health. So it really does need a focus of attention. Yeah, good, great. And, and really powerful statistics, as I said, that you mentioned earlier. Mm. One of them was that New Zealand statistics were three times as bad, mm. uh, approximately, as the UK. Why is that? Well, it's always a bit presumptuous when you get a Lancastrian talking to a Yorkshireman about <laughs> Kiwi culture, but I'm going to have a go at it, John. Um, the, the She'll Be Right culture, that positive view of the world, which is good in some respects, but it also leads to a false sense of optimism in other respects. We do research with a range of sectors about how workers feel and perceive health and safety, and they, in some pretty dangerous industries, have this belief that they're not going to be harmed. So we need to get a bit real about this, go back to those stats and say there is a lot of harm out there and you do need to take action to protect yourself. But I think some of that guidance material that we're starting to produce now hasn't really been there to the extent it is now in the past. And therefore people haven't had the resources to go to to tell them how to do this health and safety stuff uh, well in the past. So a whole clutch of reasons, I think. But we're seeing that the conversations on health and safety are starting to take place people are alive to the issue, people are looking for the resources, so hopefully we will see that track through to those improved stats. Yeah, well, great improve. great that's progress being made there. Um, oh, here's a, a nice question. Um, is it true that WorkSafe is just the fun police? We've, we've heard about companies cancelling lunchtime activities yeah. and, and cancelling after-work drinks yeah. because they're a bit scared of repercussions. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure what those repercussions are going to be. There's nothing in the law that would stop that. And another way of looking at health and safety is it's a way actually of enabling some pretty dangerous stuff to be done. If I can look at um, cutting down trees on a steep slope forest, if I look at adventure activities where you go shooting down a canyon uh, a ridiculous speed of knots on a wire rope, well, those are one, economically necessary and two, fun to do. Health and safety, having a health and safety system wrapped around that allows those things to be done, but not at an impossible and unacceptable cost. So think about health and safety as being an enabler, not a stopper of activities. And usually if you hear people saying that they need to take the coat hooks off the wall because somebody might impel themselves or they need to ban after hours drinking, then you need to say to yourself, well, that sounds a bit daft and it usually will be daft and not required by the law. Once again, Gordon, thanks very much for joining us today. Pleasure, John. And just the counter to that fun police point, um, we're interested in the serious side of health and safety, which is making sure that people return home from work healthy and safe. Absolutely. And we're going to end today's broadcast with WorkSafe's Home Time TV ad from earlier this year. So enjoy. If you're a New Zealand worker watching this, welcome home. New Zealand is a great place to live and to work. Mostly, but not for everyone. Did you know that last year, more than 23,000 people were severely injured or killed in New Zealand workplaces? That's bad enough, but that's about double the rate of Australia and three times that of the UK. That has a real cost. And none heavier than on a family that relies on a loved one. For a country that's always prided itself on looking out for one another, it's just not good enough. We need a new way of thinking about health and safety. We reckon that all New Zealanders who go to work every day, no matter what industry they are in or job they do, should be able to return home healthy and safe.
getting your home healthy and safe. That's what we're working for.